Go. Same talk though. Okay, so our next speaker is Nick Owen House, and he will talk about cluster algebra structure from decorated super peculiar spaces. Okay, thanks. So, thank you to the organizers for this conference and for inviting me uh, and Sylvester. Sylvester was originally going to give this talk, but he had some visa issues at the last minute. Thought he wasn't going to be able to come, so I ended up writing the slides. Uh, he was able to come, but only at the last minute. Uh, okay, so the, the title is a little misleading. I won't actually talk about cluster algebras or define what they are, but I will talk about things very closely related to and inspired by cluster algebras. Uh, and it was good that it was scheduled when it was because it will be very related to what Anton was just talking about in the first talk. Okay, does this thing... Okay, apparently the clicker does not actually make the slides go forward. Maybe the, the window is just not selected. Okay. Yeah, it was. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, as I said, well, it says cluster structures, but I'm not going to say what a cluster algebra is, but I'll just say that they exist for the situation that we're interested in. Uh, so if we have a surface and usually with boundary and, and marked points, then this decorated type Mueller space that Anton was talking about with coordinates given by lambda lengths has a cluster algebra structure. And I'll just kind of say in this context, what I mean by that, uh, well, okay, he mentioned that these lambda lengths coordinatize the decorated type Mueller space. So this bundle given by the choices of Horus cycles at the mark points. And I'll just call these coordinates cluster coordinates. And essentially that just means that for each triangulation, you have some nice set of coordinates and the transformation, the coordinate change formulas between these different coordinate patches are given by some sort of nice transformations. And these are these flip transformations that were pictured earlier. That's just this Ptolemy relation. So if we have two triangulations and the only difference is one diagonal, that's the boundary between two triangles, then we change by this simple rational function. Okay, so this talk is going to be very sort of combinatorial. So the sorts of questions that people are interested in, in cluster algebras are of the flavor. Okay, I have this transformation. What if I iterate these and do many, 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 many sequence of these transformations? What might these expressions end up looking like at the end of the day? So I'm going to talk about one formula. There are many, but I'm going to talk about one formula that's known for this situation and then talk about what we did to generalize that formula to the super case that Anton was talking about in the first talk. Okay, well, again, I'm not saying what cluster algebras are, but it is sort of a, a basic result in the theory that all cluster variables are Laurent polynomials. What that means in the situation is that if I have some arc that's not in the triangulation that I started with, then writing it in terms of one of the other coordinate patches of a triangulation, it's a Laurent polynomial expression. And so again, cluster algebra people like to ask, what do these expressions look like? And is there some combinatorial way to think about the terms that occur in these Laurent polynomials? And in this case of the decorated type Mueller space in the, in the lambda lengths, there are several different combinatorial formulas of this flavor that are known two of which we've generalized to the super case, but I'll just talk about one today because this is a short talk. I, I only have 25 minutes. Okay, so the one I'm gonna choose to talk about is some sort of dimer model for the lambda lengths. And dimer is just another word for perfect matching of a graph. So, okay, the situation is what I just said. There's some triangulation that's fixed, which means we have some coordinates of lambda lengths on this decorated type Mueller space. And gamma, this red arc in the picture, is some arc not in that triangulation. And we want to know what does it look like if I do a sequence of those flips to get a triangulation that has this red one, what, what does that coordinate change look like? Okay, as a Laurent polynomial. 
Okay, so there's a theorem. Uh, originally, Schiffler did it just for polygons, and then Schiffler and Musiker did it for more general surfaces, and then some other people worked on this even more. Uh, but the general form that I'm writing here is due to Ralph Schiffler and Greg Musiker. Uh, and the statement is, there is some planar graph that I'm not showing you in the picture, but I'll describe in the next couple slides. There is some graph so that this lambda length of this red arc is this Laurent polynomial expression. Okay, so being a Laurent polynomial means you can get a common denominator that's a monomial and then the numerator is a polynomial. The denominator is just the product of all the lambda lengths of the arcs that are crossed by the red line. And the numerator is this combinatorial generating function for dimer covers of this graph. So again, I haven't shown you the graph yet. I will show it to you in just a moment. And again, dimer covers just means perfect matching. Some subset of the edges of this graph so that every vertex is incident to exactly one and only one of those edges. Okay, so this is the, this is the statement. And again, what I wanna do for the rest of the time is describe in a little more detail how to think about this formula. So what is this graph? How do you build it? And then what's the generalization of this formula to the super decorated type Mueller space that Anton talked about earlier? Okay, so before I say what this graph G is in general, I'll actually just show an example. So, okay, I'll show you the recipe, but just take for granted for a moment that this is the graph G for this particular picture. We just have a pentagon and the, the arc in red is gamma and the blue, the blue labels are just the lambda lengths of those arcs. Okay, and, and the edges of this graph G are somehow labeled with the lambda lengths from the triangulation picture in some way that I'll describe later. Okay, so it's easy to see for this picture. The graph is so small, there's only three dimer covers. Yes. So there's some clear procedure to give the left hand side to get the Yeah, and I'll do this in the next slide, but just, just but for a small example. But there is a procedure, and I'll describe it in some detail in a moment. Yeah. Okay, so in this picture, there's only three dimer covers. It's, you can just stare at it for a moment. The graph's so small. I've tried to indicate them in blue. I hope that's visible. The weight of a dimer cover is just the product of the weights of the edges. And so the formula on the last page is saying that if I were to do some sequence of flips to obtain this red arc, okay, this is very small, so it would only take two flips. But if you do those sequence of those two flips, you will get this expression. So it's one over xy. Again, xy is because, oh, okay, I can do that. xy are the two diagonals that are crossed <laughs> and, uh, and, and these three terms are the, are the three dimer weights. Okay, so this is- the weight you need to add to after, when, when you make a flip to the sculptor algebra, you need to add this factor or something? Or uh, so the, when you do the sequence of flips, the result is a Laurent polynomial. The statement is if that you get a common denominator to write that Laurent polynomial as a polynomial over a monomial, then it takes this form. The total thing. The total thing, yes, written in the original coordinates. Yeah. Okay, so this was some small example. Now, now as I said, I'll, I'll describe what this G actually is and, and give the recipe to construct it from the picture. And I'll spend a little bit of time like actually saying in some detail how to construct G because the same G will actually be important in the super case. The, the answer to the same question in the super Type Mueller space will actually use the same graph, but a slightly different combinatorial object on it. Okay, so I'll describe it sort of in steps, the recipe to produce this graph. So down here is the portion of the triangulation that includes the arc. So just all the triangles that are crossed by it. And first just choose an orientation, either think of following the red arc bottom to top or top to bottom but then look at the picture so that it looks like you're going forward. And we'll one by one look at all of the triangles except the first and the last one. And we'll label them with one of two letters. For the first one, we'll label it either R or U depending on if this boundary side, oh. <laughs> if this boundary side is on your right or your left as you pass that triangle. 
okay, this might, so why did I use U instead of L for left? I'll, you'll see in a second. It's not that I don't know how to spell. Uh, okay, that's for the first triangle or, or rather the second. Then for every subsequent triangle, if you're still on the same side of the polygon as the previous one, you alternate to the opposite letter. So in this picture, we had an R, but the next triangle is also on the right, so you switch to U. And then the next one is also on the right, so you switch back to R. So as long as you stay on the same side, you just keep alternating sequence of different letters. And then, of course, you can probably guess the rest of the rule. If you go to the opposite side, you keep the same letter. So the next one now jumps over to the left. So we keep the same letter R and you continue in this way. OK, so there's only one more triangle to do. It's on the same side as the previous. So we use the opposite letter. And as I said, we don't do the first or the last triangle for whatever reason. OK. So this gives us a bunch of letters. It's some word in the alphabet with the two letters R and U. Again, why did I pick U? That seems silly. Left doesn't start with a U, um, but it stands for up. So you build the graph G just out of squares using this word in the letters R and U, and each square is just attached to the previous one, either right or up, according to this sequence. And that's it. This is the graph. So back to this picture that we had before, this graph was so simple that the word was just one letter R, and that was it. So that's where this graph came from. Okay, the second part of the recipe is I should probably say how to put the labels on it. I'll be a little more vague, but it's, it's actually pretty simple. Okay, so this is where the shape of the graph comes from, and the cluster algebra people like to call these snake graphs because it's like a snake slithers to the. Right. Like at the end of the day, uh, on the orientation you choose. Uh, no, it may sort of reflect the this graph, so that the planar embedding that we draw is maybe upside down or reflected, but the the set of dimer configurations won't change. Mm -hmm. So yes. Okay, so how to label the edges? Well, in a pretty natural way, the squares, the tiles in this graph correspond to just the squares in the triangulation. Every square comes from two neighboring triangles in the triangulation. So this, I've tried to outline them in red here. The first square really just corresponds to the first two triangles that you pass through as you're following the edge. So you just label the four sides of that by the four sides of this. In some way, I didn't put the labels because I didn't want to clutter the picture, but okay. The, you just match them up in the orientation preserving way. And then you just keep going. So the second square corresponds to the second and third triangles and so on. The, the next one to the third and fourth and on and on and on. So the number of squares is just the number of diagonals in the, in the triangulation. And so you just, again, if we look back at the example, this is where these labels come from. They're just the, if you ignore the third triangle, the E, D, Y, A are just the labels on those first two triangles, looking, ignoring the diagonal, looking at that as some quadrilateral. Can you say again how you put the labels? Because in the first case, when you have two, two adjacent triangles, they, they make quadrilateral. It right. It looks like a square. Yes. But when they have the second pair, they, it doesn't look like quadrilateral. Uh, still does. It's just very stretched. <laughs> it has one, two, three, four. So ah, I see. So the okay, I, I omitted. Yes, I omitted this technical detail. But the side that the square is attached to the previous one corresponds to the side of the triangle that's shared between the two consecutive ones in the triangulation. So the the this one. so this and this have the second triangle in common. So the label on this edge is, is the one that they're glued together. Uh, no, it, where it's attached to the previous one is the edge from the triangulation that's shared with the, the previous one. So the one that's in. 
So the, the one that's in common with the first and the second is this second triangle. And this right. is mapped to this vertical one. That's right, exactly, that's mapped to this vertical one that's shared by these two squares. Okay, a subtle point that I didn't put in the pictures is that the, the even numbered squares actually have to have opposite orientation of the labels and the odd numbered ones have normal orientation. Otherwise you can't get the labels to match up right, but okay. Okay, so again, I, I, I don't wanna draw the labels on the picture, but they come from the triangulation in this way by this sort of recipe. Okay. Yeah, so for the rest of the time, I just wanna talk about the exact same question, but in the super case using these relations that Anton talked about earlier. So we have this like super Ptolemy relation. We have these extra odd variables inside the triangles now. Okay, so again, this, this is what was said earlier. Uh, we have these even coordinates, these lambda lengths corresponding again, just to the edges in the triangulation. And now we have these extra odd variables that are inside of each triangle uh, that they call mu invariants. And we've chosen some orientation on the triangulation edges. So this is the like dual to the fat graph picture that Anton was talking about. We're instead talking about triangulations. Okay, so we sort of ignore the geometric details of the spin structure and combinatorially, we just have arrows on the edges of our triangulation. So this is all just the starting data now. Okay, and, and this is what was in Anton's slides, but the relations maybe look slightly different the way that we're writing them because we're not right. He used these like shear coordinate uh, ratios, but we've sort of multiplied out the denominators here. But this is equivalent to the expressions that he wrote. So this looks like, uh, the normal Ptolemy relation, and we just have this one extra third term that looks like the square root of the four sides around the quadrilateral times the two odd variables. And the arrow on that edge sort of tells you what order to multiply them, right? Because they don't commute. Okay, and then these are the formulas for the new odd variables and the new triangles that appear, something like this. Again, one of these has a minus sign. Oh dear, wrong button. One of these has a minus sign. So again, some place where the arrows really tell you what you have to do as you apply these relations. Okay. So these, these expressions are a little scarier than the normal Ptolemy relation. So asking the same sorts of questions, like what does this look like when you do this over and over and over again? It seems a little less hopeful maybe than in the non-super case, uh, but sort of surprisingly, the answer is still very nice. So these are the sorts of things that I wanna ask and maybe try to answer in the last uh, five to 10 minutes that I have. Okay, so again, same what I just said, what does this look like? You do this over and over and over again. In other words, you choose a different triangulation and you ask what do the coordinate change maps look like? Is it somehow similar to the non-super case? Well, yes, I spent all that time talking about it for some good reason. Uh, is there some sort of Laurent phenomenon like for cluster algebras? And this is sort of the most surprising part is that yes, there sort of is still some sort of Laurent phenomenon despite these sort of scary looking formulas with square roots in the denominator and, and all this. Uh, and also there's a couple places there where you know one of the two terms had signs and the other one didn't. And, the variables don't commute. So how, how do the signs manifest themselves in the expressions that show up? Or like what order should we multiply the odd variables? Okay. So it turns out the answer is just in terms of double dimer covers, which simply means the union or superposition of two dimer covers on top of each other. Okay, so here's a small example. Again, blue edges are, are dimer covers. If you superimpose them, okay, this is what you get. And it's not too hard to see that any double dimer cover of any graph is some disjoint union of cycles and doubled edges. Just like in this example, we have one of each. Okay. 
Okay, so here's one of our main formulas is that same situation as before. We have some arc, not in the triangulation. And G here is the same graph that we constructed on the previous slides. And the result is that the super lambda length is like the same expression. The only difference is that the sum is over double dimer covers, but of the same graph G that was constructed in the other case. I just have to sort of make sense of what do I mean here by the weight of a double dimer cover. I have to be a little careful in defining that so that this formula is true. But otherwise, the formula is identical. So it was, it was kind of surprising to us that it was this similar. Okay, so again, I should say what we mean by weight of a double dimer cover. Uh, so our definition here is that it's the product of the square roots of the lambda lengths that are labeled on the edges used in the dimer cover times some odd variables, which I'm being vague about for the moment, but essentially they're determined by what cycles appear in the double dimer cover. Remember, it's always a disjoint union of cycles and some double edges. So the cycles tell you which odd variables are going to appear in the product and more specifically, so again, remember that each square in this graph corresponds to two neighboring triangles from the triangulation. So in a natural way, every square in this graph has two of the odd variables sitting inside of it. So the answer to how do I make this less vague, this product is that for every cycle in your double dimer, you just look at the first and the last odd variable. So that's hiding in the bottom left corner and the top right corner of that cycle. And those two will appear in the product for each cycle. So if you have K cycles, then there will be two K odd variables in this product. Again, there's one more ambiguity and that's what order do you multiply them in? Because again, that matters. And this relates to the last question about like how do the signs show up or is there any kind of like positivity? Because this is another big thing in cluster algebra expansions is that not only are they Laurent polynomials, but they always have positive integer coefficients. And I'm not really gonna answer what that order is. I'm just gonna claim that there is a good order. And this is really part of the theorem from before that I was just not writing to make it more concise earlier. But part of the statement is that there is some total ordering on these odd variables. So that if you consistently multiply every monomial in that same order, then there will be no minus signs. Then all of the terms will be positive. This is a little strange and surprising because it might seem that one order that might work for one term might not work for another, but there's one coherent ordering that works globally for all of them. And it's nothing, I'm not writing what it is because it's nothing sort of obvious or naive. It's not just like order them in the order they look in the picture or anything like that. It's Yes, yes, this is re with respect to some initial chosen triangulation. That's right, yes. Uh, and I'll just end with an example. So the same example I showed before, I'll just show you the same thing, what happens in the super case. So again, there's this pentagon, uh, okay. The only difference now is I've added the odd variables to the picture in orange, theta one, two, and three. And this is how they would look in the in the picture of the graph G sitting in the, bottom left and upper right corners of each square. Uh, in this case, there's six double dimer covers. The top three are, oops, I keep hitting the wrong button. The top three are just the ordinary dimer covers, but like two copies of them, the same one sitting on top of each other. And the bottom three are sort of new. These are the ones that actually contain some cycles. And this is their weights according to what I said before. So product of the square roots of all the blue edges times whatever odd variables correspond to the cycles that are in the picture. Okay, so some of them don't have square roots because those are the doubled edges. And uh, so the theorem is saying that there's this sort of formula. Again, one over X, Y is the same. That's just the diagonals that are crossed. And this is just the generating function for these double dimer covers now. The positivity means that the coefficients here are plus one. Yeah, that's right. The positivity means that 
in this case, this example is so simple that the, the ordering from that theorem is just one, two, three, but that's only because this example is so small and simple. But yes, in this example, these are all written in the increasing order of the indices and, and these are all actually plus signs. That's right. Sorry, I didn't get it before. This also depends on the red diagram that you're choosing. Or only on the origination data? Uh, both. So the, the original triangulation is like the original data, and this formula at the bottom is the super lambda length of this red edge. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but the ordering um, for the coefficients that makes that positive. Ah, yes. The order, yeah, I think this was the same question that he was asking. The ordering of the coefficients that makes these all positive in this example is just one, two, three. Yeah, but it depends on that red diagonal. Uh, yes, okay. yes. Each diagonal might, yeah, have a different ordering that you need to choose. That's right. Yes. Okay. And that's all. That's about out of time. Thank you. Great job.